Ecclesiastes chapter 7. The man who fears God. A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of the mourning, but the heart of the fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to a song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. Extortion turns a wise man into a fool and the bribe corrupts the heart. The end of a matter is better than its beginning and patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Wisdom, like an inheritance, is good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this, that the wisdom preserves the life of its possessor. Consider what God has done. Who, has straight, who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. When times are sad, uh, bad, consider God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover uh, anything about his future <coughs> in his meaningless life of mine. In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these: a righteous man perishing in his righteousness, and the wicked man living long in his wickedness. Do not be over righteous, neither be over wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over wicked, and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not and not let go of the other. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes. Wisdom makes one wise man more powerful than ten rulers in a city. There is not a righteous man on earth uh, who does what is right and never sins. Do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you, for you know in your heart that many times you yourselves have cursed others. All this I tested by wisdom, and I said, I am determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. Whatever wisdom may be, uh, it is far off and most profound. Who can discover it? So I turned my mind to understand and to investigate and to search out wisdom and scheme of things and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare, whose heart is a trap and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. Luke says the teacher, this is what I've discovered, adding one thing to another to discover the scheme of things while I was still searching but not finding. I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. This only have I found. God made mankind upright, and men have gone in search of many schemes. Who is like the wise man who knows the explanation of things? Wisdom brightens a man's face and changes his hard appearance. Amen. That's right, we're going to do it all. <laughs> we need God's help, so let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you and praise you for your grace, for your word, and we pray that you will open this portion of the scriptures for us so that our face may be brightened by the countenance of the light that comes from you. We pray that not a single one will leave this sanctuary without being fed by your word. May the, your word become bread of life that feeds our soul. We thank you and praise you for this time. Strengthen your people for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me ask you, what you are good at? What are you good at? What do you or can you show off uh, to other people about? Whenever my kids call me like daddy and then they want to show off about themselves wanting to receive my approval. These days my boys are into computer games. So they say, daddy look at this and they show off their scores or something like that, improved scores. Uh, then I want to say to them, so what? So what you're good at computer games? Well, 
Why aren't you good in something else that's beneficial to me or something? Or in school or something like that. But uh, I, of course, I don't say that. I want to say that, but I don't say that. I smile and say, good, but I still think it in my mind. Uh, what are you good at? And many people show off, like if they have athletic ability, they say, well, I'm good in this, and they show off their athletic ability. Some of you, it's great. You are a nerd, and you have always have been, and you want to show off your grades to people. Uh, some of you know everything, all the trivial knowledge, you, useless things. You know, there are those people who knows all the useless facts, useful facts they don't know, but the, all the useless things, like, you know, things like the information in Jeopardy or something like that. You know those things. Uh, some people are handy, and they're good with, with uh, things uh, they can fix with their hands. <coughs> and they say, I'm good in this, and they like to serve people with those things. Some people are externally beautiful. Uh... Some people, everybody's good in something. Everybody has something to show off. My question is, what do you think is better? Is it, is it better to possess knowledge or beauty, grades, handy uh, <coughs> handy hands, <laughs> or, or uh, athletic ability? What is better? What determines what, what's better? What do you want to have? It really depends on the goal. Uh, that you want to achieve, right? If you want to win in a volleyball tournament or basketball tournament, then you athletic ability is useful. That's better than grades. Who cares about grades if you want to win an athletic event? But if you want to get into a PhD program and earn status in a society, who cares about winning dumb basketball, right? You need good grades. That's better than athletic event. Uh, if you want to make million dollars, and who you want to be in the, what is that show? Who wants to be a million shilling or a million dollars? Who wants to be a millionaire? Something like that. If you want to be in the show and win the million dollars, then useless knowledge is important. Uh, if, if, if you, you have a husband like me, you need to be handy. Uh, because <laughs> I know how to break things. That's my gift. And my wife is very good in fixing things with her hands. Now, if you want to fix things in the hand, in the household, being handy is better than knowing the useless knowledge uh, in Jeopardy or something like that. Now, if you're beautiful externally, I don't know what good that is, but it's, it's I guess, better than being ugly. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's okay to have it, I guess. But I don't know what useful that is. Use, if you want to win in American... Uh, beauty, USA, pageant, or something like that, then I guess it's useful. What is better? What determines what's better? What determines uh, the value? Uh, I think this passage is saying, <coughs> when you want to be good in something, right? you want something in your heart, then you attain wisdom. So if you want to be good in sports, you really want that, and something you want is there, when you really want it, you improve in your wisdom, in playing sports. If you want to get good grades, you improve wisdom in grades. That's wisdom what we've been talking about up to now. Okay? So what you want in your heart, you attain it, you try to, you know how to attain it with your mind. That's wisdom. Uh, chapter two especially talk about that kind of wisdom, worldly wisdom. We call it worldly wisdom. So when you want to attain something, you, you become good at it. You attain wisdom concerning it. But, as we look into this passage, this chapter, now it talks about godly wisdom. So if your goal is to get good grades, you attain wisdom, knowing how to study, knowing how to uh, take exams, things like that. But now if you want to please God in your life, if you really love God and you know you're going to face God at the end of this life, then you gain wisdom concerning that. You fear God, you attain wisdom. I think Wisdom in this chapter, in chapter 7, talks about that kind of wisdom. So when you look into verse 13 and 14 of this chapter, it says, it says this, uh, consider what God has done. Who can straighten? Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. When times are sad, uh, what times are bad, consider what God has made. The, uh, the one as well as the other. Therefore, man cannot discover anything about his future. God is sovereign. God is in control. So who knows what is good? At the end of chapter 6, 
verse 12 and 13 uh, also talks about that and asks this question, for who knows what is good for a man in life? Who determines what is good? During the few days of meaningless days he passes through like a shadow. Who can tell him what will happen under the sun after he is gone? So what it is saying is God determines what is good. And if you know what is good, then you have wisdom in your life to attain those things. So if your goal is to please God, okay, you'll attain wisdom in life. So wisdom, according to this chapter, is living this life. This is a definition of wisdom. Wisdom is living this life in preparation for the next life to face God. That's what wisdom is in this chapter. Living this life in preparation for the next life to face God. You're going to face the creator of the world, creator of the universe, and the judge of life. And wisdom is living with that end in view. Living in the present with the end in view. It's like that marathon runner who's running and the 26 mile, you just have, you know, little distance to go and you're running knowing that the end is near. You are not going to quit there. It's like the Game 7 of the World Series. And today, I guess there's a Game 7, if you didn't know, of the World Series. Roger Clemens and Kurt Chilling, they're preparing for the seventh game. And that's in their view. And they're preparing themselves. Uh, the man who fears God knows that at the end of life, he can face God any time because death can come. The man who fears God knows what is better because he has that end in view and will be a better person because he has that end in view. That's the summary of this chapter. The man who fears God knows what's better and will be a better person. That's That will be kind of outline. Knows what's better. If you fear God, you know what's better and you will be a better person. So we'll outline this chapter with seven betters and two bees. Seven betters and two bees. If you really fear God, you know seven things that are better, and you'll become two beings. We'll talk about that. Seven betters and two bees. Verse, verses one to, one to twelve talks about seven betters. Okay? Number one, if you really fear God, living with the end in view, first of all, you'll know the better day. I'll just mention the seven things. The better day, better place, better emotion, better words, better focus, better time, better shelter. Okay. I'll mention those this again. If you didn't get it, don't worry about it. First of all, the better day. I'm just going to go right through these verses, so come along with me in this trip through this chapter. First of all, a good name is better than, the word better than, in, uh, in Hebrew word is tov, is constantly used in this chapter, uh, about 14 times in this chapter, because it's this chapter is answering the question that at the end of verse 16, or at the end of chapter 6 says, for who knows what is good, the word is good there, but it's better. Who knows what is better, tov, for a man in life now, he answers this question and constantly repeating this. So verse 1, first better is better day. It says, a good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death is better than the day of birth. Good name is better than fine perfume, a day of death better than the day of birth. What is that saying? Basically saying the death day is better than the birthday. The death day is better than the birthday. Why? And then it says, Good name is better than fine perfume. How is that related? It's related, believe it or not, but how is that related? Good name, fine perfume, that day, birthday. Well, according to the Hebrew concept, name represents the character of a person. So it's talking about inside of a person. Name, good name, good character of a person is better than fine perfume. What is it talking about fine perfume? It's talking about the aroma of the external. Just because you smell nice doesn't mean you are a good person. So the verse is saying the inner character of a person is more important than out of fragrance. The inner character of a person is more important 
than outer fragrance. So on a death day, when you die, true inner character is revealed. But not necessarily when you're first born. Not on your birthday. Think about it. When a baby is born, baby's cute. Okay? Now, but we have no idea what kind of bratty kid this is going to turn out to be. Everybody's happy. It looks cute. And there's no ugly baby, so we, can, we think they're cute, but we don't know what kind of uh, bratty kid it's going to turn out to be. So we don't really know. We just know they're externally cute. But thing is, on a death day, everybody knows how they lived. So inner character is revealed. So baby is like a perfume. <laughs> we just know the external things of the child. We don't know what is embedded in that baby's heart. So the point of this verse is, uh, you know the better day. At the end of the day, the day you die. Okay? Uh, why is that better? Because God sees the inside of a person on the judgment day. Remember, this, this whole chapter is with the end in view. We're going to face God, the judge of life. Okay? So, And God's going to judge us inside on the judgment day rather than your external outside. That's why good name in the inner character is better than fine perfume. And the day of death, which reveals your inner character, is better than the day of your birth. So you know the better day, first of all. Secondly, second better is this. If you really fear God, you know the better place. Verse 2 talks about that. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man, and living should take this to the heart. What does it mean? Funeral is better than festival. That's a better place. Why? Because you have the end in view. Basically, this, this verse is saying, you're all going to die. You're all going to die. I'm not saying that. The Bible is saying that. You're all going to die. And you should think about it while you're alive. That's what this verse is saying. It makes you live, if you really think about it, if you meditate on death, a lot of godly people in the history constantly say you should think more about your death because then your life will change. How you live will be transformed. It makes you, it makes you live accordingly. If you know that you're going to face God five minutes later, if you know you're going to live for five more minutes, then it will be different. If you know I'm going to visit your room, in uh, a day, you know you're going to clean your room today. Just like that, if we know we're going to meet God, we're going to clean our hearts. It makes you live accordingly if you meditate on death. Uh, you will live in preparation of meeting God. Like, if you know there is an exam in an hour, I don't know about you, but me, I'm like, if I, if I have an hour before the exam, something about my brain turns on. I remember everything that I read, read in that hour. Is that, are you like that? Anything before that, I don't remember anything. But for that last hour of the, of the exam, I remember everything. Anybody like that? Anybody? Couple people. Uh, it's just like that. If you, if you know that we're going to see God right away, okay? and we have that in view, our life will be different. Different. Death makes you evaluate your life. When when this happened in uh, 9/11, you know what happened? September 11th uh, thing. Many people are living in fear and all these things. And we should pray that they should think more about death, so that our lives won't change. Festival and parties has no such effect. And a wedding, wedding. If you go to wedding, what do you think about? You're thinking about who you're going to marry. You look at people, but you don't really think about them, right? <laughs> you're pu putting yourself in that position. And who am I going to marry? Where is he? Where is she? Uh, on a funeral, what do you think about when you go to funeral? You think about who's going to come to my funeral. You're going to come? You talk to other people. You think about other people. Some of you are saying nobody's going to come to mine. Uh, <coughs> well, what the Bible is saying is as you think about death, you should think about who you're going to meet after you pass the coffin. That's what the Bible is, Bible is saying. So man who fears God knows the end in view, knows the better place. Better place is funerals rather than festival because you have the end in view. Third, better 
is this. Better emotion. Verse 3 and 4 talks about that. Better emotion. Sorrow is better than laughter. Because sad face is good for the heart. Heart of the wise is in the house of the morning. But the heart of the fools is in the house of pleasure. A wise person who fears God and lives this life to meet God, the creator of the universe and the judge of life, thinks much about death, while the fool thinks only about having fun now. Uh, it's not wrong to have fun. I have fun as well, but it's better to be serious. Why? Because life is serious. Life is serious because this moment will never come back again. Think about that. This moment right now will never come back again. And we need to make the most at this time. We need to learn how to get the grin off of our faces. We need to be serious. We need to know how to be serious. It's okay to laugh. I'm not saying don't laugh. When I attempt to make a joke, you got to laugh. Uh, but, you know... Most of the times in our lives, we need to be serious. Sorrow is better than laughter because the serious reflection of facing God has refining influence in our soul. Uh, fourth better is this, better words. Fourth better is better words. Verse 5 talks about that. What better words? Verse 5, it is better to heed a wise man's rebuke. Then listen to the songs of the fools. And the verse 6 talks about, Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This too is meaningless. And then he says, Extortion turns a wise man into a fool, and a bribe corrupts the heart. What in the world do they have to do with anything to do with each other? But it's very much related. Related with better words. It says that uh, rebuke. Of a wise man is better than the songs of the fools. What is that talking about? Songs of the fool. Praise of the fools. If, you're, if a fool, foolish person praises you, uh, that's worse than rebuke of the wise person. Rebuke of the wise person is a lot better. Why? Because you have the end in view. End in view. You're going to see God. You're going to be judged. Many times songs of the fools is like a sweet poison. Rebuke of the wise is like bitter medicine. Songs of the fools, when somebody flatters you, oh, it's sweet, but it kills you, doesn't it? It makes you proud, it kills you. But rebuke of the wise, it's bitter, and they come to you, oh, this person coming again, is going to say something? But it's bitter, but it's a, it's a medicine, it makes you better. Hmm? Sometimes people say good things in front of your face and then talk bad things behind your back. But you need people who will talk straight to your face and talk good things behind your back. Good friends are like that. Songs of the fools are what makes you feel good now. But rebuke of the wise is what makes you good. Songs of the fools are what makes you feel good. Rebuke of the wise are what makes you good. What do you want? You want something that makes you feel good or you want something make, that makes you good? Uh, when pastors come to me and say, Pastor Min, what do you think about what I preached? I ask them, uh, I tell them, uh, do you want the honesty or you want me to be honest or you want me to be nice? <laughs> and they usually uh, with bitter green grin, uh, you know, okay, be honest. And then I am honest with them. And it becomes uh, medicine. You know, it becomes medicine. Do you want something that makes you feel good or do you want something makes, that makes you good? Our songs of the fools are pleasure of temporary. Rebuke of the wise is preparation of the eternity. What do you want? Pleasure of temporary or preparation of eternity. What do you want? Uh, that Rebuke is compared to like this. Uh, songs of the fools are compared to like crackling thorns under the pot. What does that mean? <laughs> well, thorns are good for something. What? What is, was it, what is it good for? It's good to be burnt. What happens when the thorns are burnt? It makes noise. It makes noise as it's burnt. And what happens? It gives good fire for a few seconds and that dies quickly. 
Songs of the fools, praises of fools are like that. It makes a lot of noise. It gives good fire just for a few seconds. It makes you feel good, and it's gone. Uh, burning thorns are burnt, makes noise. Sudden flame, gone, useless. So is the temporary feelings that are given by the songs of the fools. The next verse is compared to that as, as well. Extortion turns a wise man into a fool and bribe corrupts the heart. Extortion and bribe, what's that got to do with anything? Well, there's, they, both of them have to do with cheap feelings, temporary feelings. Uh, if we dwell on them, right, if we dwell on them, it'll corrupt us. Remember, live with eternity in view, whether you are suffering or whether you are, uh, you know, uh, flattered with bribe. It's just temporary thing. If you dwell on them, it will corrupt your heart. So live with eternity in view. You're going to face God. You're going to be judged by God. Know how to listen to the rebuke of the wise, which will last. Temporarily, it'll be bitter, but it'll make you better. Uh, better words. Number five. Fifth better is better focus. Fifth better is better focus. Verse 8 and 9 talks about that. The end of the matter is better than its beginning. And patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of the fools. Better focus. What is the better focus? Remember, focus on the end. Focus at the end. On the end rather than the beginning. Okay? End is better. And end of the matter is better than its beginning. Uh, he may be speaking to the people who are going through unjust situations or suffering and difficulties. And he's saying to the people, life is going to end. Your present suffering will be over. So don't just focus on the excitement of the beginning, but focus on finishing the race. Focus on finishing till the end rather than excitement of the beginning. There are a lot of people who excitingly uh, start the book or start things in the beginning. And then can't really finish. You In your shelf, you have all these books that you started ever since kindergarten. And then you have all these books and didn't finish your book. Right? Learn how to finish things. Better focus on the end. Because that's what you're going to be judged by. Focus on the finishing till the end rather than excitement of the beginning. Humbly be patient. Because if you're going through suffering and hardship and you feel, if you just focus on the suffering of now rather than finishing till the end, it's going to pass you're going to get angry. Isn't that what he's saying? Verse 9, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit. And anger resides in the lap of the fools, meaning you befriend the fools. That anger is always with, with you. Humbly be patient rather than proudly be angry and bitter. Anger and complain is the friend of the fools. So better focus on the end and pass through the sufferings of the present and finish the race. That's what a fifth better is talking about. Sixth Better is better time. Verse 10 uh, talks about the sixth. Better is better time. Uh, it says in verse 10, Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Why were the old days better than this? What, what that verse is talking about is, as you face the trials and hardships of life, one of the ways you can complain is reminisce of the past, like the Israelites. They are in the wilderness. They are going through hardship. What do they say? Oh, I remember the garlics I used to eat. And you brought us, I was saying to Moses, you brought us here so that we can die here. No water to drink, no garlic to eat. Uh, they think about the past. Even though they were suffering for 400, over 400 years and suffered in the, uh, under uh, uh, slavery, they don't think about the pain, but think about just the garlic that they were eating. And then they complain of the present. Some people said the uh, reason we, pr we uh, reason we praise the past is because of bad memory and good imagination. A lot of times that's what happens. We remember all the bad things and we just, you know, exaggerate the good things and say, "Yeah, you said used to be good old days," and then we complain about the present. But according to the Bible, present is always better than the past. Present, the present is always better than the past. Why? According to the Bible, God says in Romans chapter 8, God works for the good of those who love him. 
And when he says God works for the good, there in that context is talking about Christ likeness. Meaning, if the Holy Spirit comes in us, when we become Christians, we are constantly growing. Meaning, we are better today than yesterday. Amen? That's what the scripture says. Meaning, why is the present better than the past? Because we are more like Jesus right now than yesterday if the Spirit of God is in us. And the progressiveness of our sanctification uh, tells us that we are better today than yesterday. We are more ready to face the creator of the universe if we are to be judged right now and the evaluator of life. We are ready to face him more today than yesterday because we are growing and God is working for the good. Uh, Christ-likeness for those who love him. Don't think about the past and grumble. Think about the present grace for steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy and grace is new every morning. Every day, He can make us more like Christ. Think about the present grace. No matter what kind of situation you're going through, no matter how much suffering and difficulty, hardships that you are going through, more hardship right now even than yesterday, God's grace is available today. Just as He was yesterday. Just God is saying yesterday, today, and forevermore. His present grace is always here. So be thankful. And He's making you more like Christ. So today, you're better. Then you say, don't reminisce of the past and learn. If you made a mistake, learn from the mistake and go on. Uh, if you have good days, learn from the, uh, think about the past and be thankful that God is the same today and continue on. Better time is now than yesterday. Seventh better, written in verse 11 and 12, is better shelter. Uh, 11 and 12, better shelter. Wisdom. Like an inheritance is a good thing. In NIV translation, it's good thing, but it's same word, tov, better. Okay? Wisdom, like an inheritance, is good thing and benefits those who seize the sun. Wisdom is a shelter and a money is a shelter. <laughs> Wisdom is a shelter, defender. Wisdom is defender and money is defender. But the advantage of wisdom or knowledge is this, that wisdom preserves the life of its possessor, which money cannot do. Uh, what is that talking about? Well, money can, money is given, and wisdom is given. Money can protect and defend, of course, in a worldly way, but wisdom can also defend and protect in a worldly way as well. But only wisdom, wisdom here means God-fearing heart. We know that there's end in view, we're going to be judged by God. Okay? That attitude, God-fearing attitude, so we live this life according to that wisdom, can revive us, preserve us, sustain our life. You can only have money in the pocket, but wisdom in your mind and heart internally. Only wisdom you can have internally. Okay? That's what he's saying when he says only wisdom can preserve the life of its possessors. So when we have wisdom, right, we can be valuable person. Give, uh, wisdom gives value to a person. Why? Because he lives with end in view and you live accordingly. So he protects you, uh, not only from human beings, but also piercing, judging eyes of God. Why? Because at the end, if we live wisely according to his will right now, at the end, when we are judged, it will protect us from piercing, judging eyes of God. That's why wisdom is better shelter. Let's go to, uh, we talked about seven betters. Now we go to two Bs. Rest of the chapter talks about two Bs. Okay? Man who fears God will be a better person. Two kinds of Bs. What kind of people? What kind of, what kind of person will, will they be? Look at verse 13. We'll set that up and then talk about those two beings. Two Bs. Verse 13 says, consider what God has done. This is the center of this chapter. Consider what God has done. God is sovereign. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. God is in control. God is sovereign. God ordains things. Uh, but we see the reality of life in verse 15. 
Sometimes righteous men per uh, perishes, and sometimes wicked people ch just continue on being su successful. What is the reality of life here? Verse 15, he says, In the meaningless less, uh, life of mine, I have seen both of these, a righteous man perishing in his righteousness, and a wicked man living long in, the, in his wickedness. So God is sovereign, God is control, yet I see this unjust things happening, wicked man being successful and righteous man perishing, suffering. So how should I live? Verse 16 and 17 talks about those two B's. Verse 16, it says, do not be over-righteous. Verse 7, do not be over-wicked. Do not be over-righteous or do not be over-wicked. What is that talking about? Well, when it says do not be over-righteous, it's talking about, it's talking about self-righteousness. Do not be self-righteous. Who thinks he's wise, that's why neither be over-wise. So if you're self-righteous, you know what you're doing. I'm good, and I know. I'm good, and I know a person. Self-righteous person. Don't be self-righteous. Uh, and then it says, when it says, do not be over-wicked, it's talking about, you know, do not be unrighteous. So what it's telling you not to do is be self-righteous and unrighteous. Don't be self-righteous. And don't be unrighteous. Don't be self-righteous. What is a self-righteous person? I'm good. I know. I know everything. Okay? No humility to listen. Uh, always someone else is wrong. I'm not wrong. Okay? Uh, also, you are not to be unrighteous. No self-righteousness. No unrighteousness. So, rather than this person, this person is kind of opposite. Self-righteous person has the crooked backbone. Uh, but don't want to fix that. Unrighteous person has no backbone. So what happens? Always swayed by all kinds of temptations and philosophies and lies. So you're impure. So self-righteous person has this crooked backbone. Unrighteous person has no backbone. Always swayed by temptation. So negatively saying, don't be self-righteous, don't be unrighteous. We'll change that positively saying, then be humble. Rather than be self, un, don't be self-righteousness, we turn it opposite and say, be humble, don't be unrighteous, be pure. So two B's there, be humble and be pure. If you're humble and pure, you can become a person who fears God. In fact, if you fear God, you'll be humble and be pure. Isn't that what verse 18 is saying in the next verse? 18, it says, it is good to grasp the one and not let go the other. Man who fears God will avoid both, it says all, but both extreme, both extreme. So you will be humble and you will be pure. You will not be self-righteous, you will be, you will not be unrighteous, but you'll be rather humble and pure. If you fear God, you'll be humble and you'll be, you'll be pure. That's a good definition of fearing God. Humbling, humble before the Lord because you fear God. And because you fear God, you become pure in your heart, in your life. I think rest of the chapter talks about that as we, con as we read from that perspective. It just makes total sense as we look at the rest of the uh, chapter. So be humble. Verse 19 through 25 talks about that. Be pure. 26 to 29 talks about that. Let's read it. Humility. Have humility a humble mindset, and then read from verse 19. It says, Wisdom makes one wise, uh, w uh, one wise more, more powerful than ten rulers in a city. If you're humble before the Lord, humble person who depends on the Lord, if you're that one person, one person who's humble before the Lord, depending on the strength of God, is more powerful than ten rulers in a city. Think about that. Ten rulers who's who depends on their wisdom. But one person who depends on the wisdom of God, who is humble before the Lord, is more powerful. Verse 20, there is not a righteous man on earth. You think you know, you think you're righteous? Nobody is righteous. Be humble, that's what he's saying. Who does what is right and never sins? Do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you. If you keep hearing what other people say of you, you get to de uh, uh, defend yourself. Why? Because you want to protect your reputation, pride, right? But as you hear those things that people say, negative things of you, verse 22 says, you do the same thing, for you know in your heart that many times you yourselves have cursed others. Meaning, you're not only a victim, you're also a victimizer. Okay? 
be humble. You, are, you may be sinned against at times, but you sin against other people as well. Be humble. That's the point. 23. All this I tested by wisdom. And I said, now Solomon, knowing everything, knowing so many things, one of the most wise person in this world, basically humbling himself and saying, I don't know anything. Verse 23 says, I am determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. Whatever wisdom may be, it is far off and most profound. Who can discover it? So I turned my mind to understand, to investigate, to search out wisdom and scheme of things. And it says, and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. What did he say? I am determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. He's saying, I do not know much. I mean, one of the most wise persons said, I do not know much. How humble was he? How humble humble do we need to be? If we fear God, we will humble ourselves before the Lord. 26 and 20, uh, rest of the chapter talks about purity. Not only to humility, but purity. Isn't that what he's saying? Verse 26. I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare, whose heart is a trap, whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner, she will ensnare. It's a, it's, it's like she's a hunter. She hunts for this man, uh, tempting him. And he says, her heart is a trap. Her desire is a trap. Her center of the being is a trap. And sn- the word snare and trap is like a net. Hunter nets. And, uh, she's like trapping him with her nets and snares, temptation. And it says, if you fear God, if you have the end in view, you'll be pure, you will overcome temptation. It says, the man who pleases God will escape her. What is the point? If you really have the end in view, you will overcome a lot of temptations in your life. Why? Because you want to please God. You have the end in view, you're going to see Him face to face. If you are on that last lap of that 26 miles, you are not going to quit in the last lap. You are not going to quit. You're going to keep running. No matter what kind of temptation you have to quit, you are not going to keep quit. You're going to keep going. That's what he's saying. You will be pure if you have the end in view. Uh, if you fear God, you'll be humble and you'll be pure. Continuing on, it says in verse 20, While I was searching but not finding, I found one upright man among thousands, and not one upright woman among them all. Huh, I didn't say that. The Bible is saying, it says not one upright man, uh, I found one upright, there is at least one upright man among thousands, not one upright woman among them all. What does that mean? I don't know. I'm not going to make any comments about this and get in trouble. Uh, maybe he's, you know, Solomon had 1,000 wives, 700 wives, and 300 concubines. And maybe he saw all these wives and said, Oh, man, not a, not a single good woman among 1,000. Is that what he's saying? I don't know. But we know that it is a, a Hebrew poetic device. Usually when when you mention things like this, Man is always mentioned first and the woman is one mentioned second. And it's a Hebrew poetic device to talk about collectively man and woman. Okay? So I think what this verse is saying is collectively man or woman, there is no righteous person. I found one upright man among a thousand, not one upright woman among them all. And that's why verse 29 collectively says, This only have I found. God made mankind upright, but men have gone in search of many schemes. So collectively, men and women, says, I have not found anyone righteous. Uh, look at verse 29 carefully. It says, This only have I found. God made mankind upright. Both men, plural, universality of sinfulness of man, men have gone in search, deliberate, deliberate search uh, in their wickedness. And it says, Many schemes, many, multi-form of sins, schemes, intentionality, a sinfulness of human being, deliberate overcoming of what would otherwise be expected. Scheme goes against uh, the righteousness. It's comprehensively talking about sinfulness of men. 
Verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, it ends like this. We're almost done. But can you believe that? Who is like this wise man? Who is like the wise man? Who knows the explanation of things, interpretation of things? It says, wisdom brightens a man's face and changes his hard appearance. Remember, wisdom brightens man's face. What does that mean? Wisdom, that God-fearing heart. We, with the end in view, you fear God. You are humble before the Lord and you want to be pure. Then what happens? It brightens man's face. How is man's face affected? If your heart is affected. Uh, number, Numbers chapter 6 verse 25. Priests would uh, declare blessings on the people and say, May God shine His face upon you. So when God shines His wisdom upon us, our hearts, hearts and our minds are brightened. And it'll show in our countenance uh, God's light, God's holiness, God's blessings in our lives. That's what he's saying. You know, if wisdom comes inside of our heart, God-fearing heart, God is a judge and we live in light of that perspective. We become humble and pure before the Lord. We will shine His holiness. We will radiate His holiness. It changes us within and it will show outside. Why? Because we, because we become humble and pure before the Lord. I think about the cross and perfect picture of that is shown. I look at the cross and I say, I deserve to be on that cross. I am, I deserve to be hell. I deserve to be in hell. I deserve to receive the wrath of God. And when Jesus carries the hell on the cross, when Jesus received all the wrath on the cross, I deserve to be in that place. I'm humbled by the cross. I'm humbled by the accusation of the cross. And I, I, all I can say is, honestly, Lord, I deserve the cross. It teaches me humility. But also, when I go to the cross, it teaches me purity. Why? Because Jesus died in my place, I can be forgiven. Because Jesus died for me, He overcame everything. With his resurrection power, he can purify me as I continue to repent my sin. There on the cross, I'm humbled and I'm purified because of my Lord Jesus Christ. And isn't that what Jesus says or isn't that what Bible says? When the cross is foolishness to mankind, the wisdom of God. What wisdom of God is this? Because God uh, solves the problem of man on the cross. Foolishness to the mankind. Why would Son of God die on the cross? Oh, but the wisdom of God is we can be humble on the cross. Humble at the foot of the cross, yet be pure at the foot of the cross. If you fear God, you will know what's better. And you will be a better person, humble and pure before the Lord. Let's pray. Fearing God is living today in light of the end in view. That's why the better days, death day is better than the birthday. Because we're all going to die. And we're going to be evaluated by our name. What we have become. What inner character is built in our lives? We need to think about our death more often because we're going to see the creator and the judge, creator of the universe and the judge of our life. Then we know the better place. Funeral is better than festival. We will become serious of our life. Death makes us Evaluate our life. We'll have better emotion. Uh, being more serious in our lives. Uh, we will not seek for the grin of our face. We will get the grin off of our faces. Sorrow is better than laughter because serious reflection of facing God has refining influence. On us. We will seek for the rebuke of the wise rather than the songs of the fools. 
because we will not seek for what makes us feel good, but what makes us good. We'll have better focus. Our life is going to end, and we'll have our end in view. So even as we face hard times, we'll not think about the reminiscing of the past and miss the past, but we will live in the present because He's making us more like Jesus. And we will hide behind His presence with the, with the wisdom that He gives in fearing Him. We will be more humble people. We will be more pure people standing at the foot of the cross. All of us live for somebody's evaluation. That's why you get embarrassed. When you get embarrassed, you are afraid of the evaluation of other people. For some of you, you get frustrated because you are living for the evaluation of yourself, of your own standard. But the only evaluation that counts is God's. The evaluation belongs to the Lord. And at the end of life, at the end of the day, God will evaluate us. How much do we love God? How much do we fear God? How have we lived this life according to the end in view? So let's be wise people who make the most of every opportunity. And at this moment, and this moment will never come back again. And make the most of every opportunity. Asking God to change your heart and give you wisdom to live a life worthy of His grace. Let's pray to the Lord for a few minutes. Lord, we thank you for your presence in our lives. Give us wisdom to know the end is coming. Give us wisdom to know the brevity of life. Give us wisdom to know that this moment will never come back again. And help us to make the most of every opportunity. Give us wisdom to know that you are present in our lives and help us to live in fear and love of you. Be honored and glorified through your people. May you shine your face upon us so that we may be changed and transformed to live for your glory. Lord, help us to know you're present in our lives. Transform our lives so that you can be shown through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we rise and sing?
face to face and we're going to be evaluated on how much we are like Christ all we can do is Lord as I turn my face towards you may you shine your light upon me may you shine your blessings upon me as I turn my face to you may you shine your face upon me make me more like Jesus and let's pray that as we sing this song Unshakable, immovable, faithful and true, full of wisdom, 
strength and beauty. These things are true of you. Fearless, courageous, righteousness shines through in all you do. Yeah, you're so humble. You lay down your life. These things are true of and you. As I turn. And, and as I turn my face to you, O oh Lord, I ask and pray by the power of your love. And These things true of me too. Make these things true of me too. Patient, compassion. Patient, compassion. Love flows through you. You never give up on the hopeless ones. These things are true of you. Holy and blameless, you stand up for justice. And truth, yet you love mercy and forgiveness. These things are true of you. And as I turn my face to you, O oh Lord, I ask and pray. Power of your love and grace. Make these things true of me too. Make these things true of me too. Unshakable. Unshakable. Immovable. Faithful and true, you're full of wisdom, full of wisdom, strength and beauty. These things are true of you, fearless, courageous. Righteousness shines through in all you do. Yeah, you're so humble. You lay down your life. These things are true of you. Shine your face upon us. And then as I turn my face to you, oh Lord, I ask. And pray by the power of your love and grace. Make these things true of me too. Make these things true of me too. Shine your face. And as I turn my face to you, O Lord, I ask and pray by the power of your love and grace. Make these things true of me too. Make these things true of me too. Patient, compassionate. Patient, compassionate. 
love flows through you. Thank you, Lord. You never give up on the hopeless one. These things are true. And as I turn, shine you. your face upon us. And as I turn my face to you, O oh Lord, I ask and pray by the power of your love and grace. Make these things true of me too. Make these things true of Sing the second me too. Verse. One more time. Patient, compassion. Patient, compassion. Love flows through you. Never give up. You never give up on the hopeless one. These things. Are true of you. And as I turn turn my face to you, oh Lord, I ask and pray by the power of your love and grace. Make these things. True of me too. Make these things true of me too. As I turn my face to you, may you shine. And as I turn my face to you, O Lord, I ask and pray by the power of your These things true of me too. Make 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 by the power of your love and grace, make these things true of me too. Make these things true of me too. Make these things true of me. Pray to the Lord. Make these things true of me too. Make these things true of me too. Make these things true. Make these things true of me too. Make these things true of me too. Pray that one more time. Make these things. Make these things true of me too. Make these things. True of me too. Just pray to the Lord for a few minutes with silence of your voice, but loudness, scream of your heart, cry out to the Lord. For He said He works for the good of those who love Him. He is changing you. You're gonna overcome your addictions. You're gonna overcome the habits. That you cannot tell other people about. You're gonna grow. You are not hopeless. If you are, He would not give up on you. We're gonna pray. We'll never, never give up on you. We never give up on you. Let's pray to the Lord in hope. Do not swim in your self pity and hopelessness. We're gonna go on. We're going to grow. Come on, let's pray. Let's go to the throne of God's grace.
cry out to the Lord. Make me more like you, Lord. Shine your face upon me. Help me, Lord. He's going to be with you. Okay? We will pray for you. Pray to the Lord for a few minutes. Lord, we thank you for your presence that we can boldly approach your throne or to receive the scepter of your grace. We thank you that we can be in your presence to receive your present grace and your grace will lead us home. Your grace will help us to overcome anything, everything that com comes away. Thank you for your grace and mercy and kindness. Thank you that you don't give up on us. Thank you that you will finish the work that you have begun in us. Lord, continue to work in our hearts so that we may become more like you. Lord, some of us are discouraged and swimming in helplessness. I, we pray for our brothers and sisters that you would give them lavishing grace to overcome, be strengthened, so that they'll be encouraged and strengthened and empowered to grow, to become more like you. Strengthen your people. Strengthen your people so that we may be more like you. Make us holy people uh, that loves you and reflects you. Shine your face upon your people, your children, so that your children mo will bo become more like you. Strengthen you. As we pray that within our hearts may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, awesome and incredible, never-ending love of our God, koinonia, fellowship, empowerment, light of the Holy Spirit, be with you all, both now and forever and evermore. And all God's children said, Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to thank you all for.